And next up, you're also in for another treat. We're going to actually hear from the CEO of Fisker. So we have Henrik Fisker, and we're going to do a little bit of couple things. So you're going to show, uh, see a quick video, and then you're going to hear from Henrik himself. And then after that, you're going to have a chance to have a Q&A session with him and Jonathan Collegio. So make sure that you stay tuned, enjoy, hang out, um, because we're going to have some great information and follow those tenets that we just talked about, which is learn, foster those new relationships, and then all continue to grow. So tune into the screen. Fisker is driven by people like you, the innovators, who know that the choice Fisker is driven by people like you, the innovators, who know that the choices we make today matter for tomorrow. And like you, we're moving through the world a little differently. Introducing the Fisker Ocean, an all-electric SUV featuring a solar panel roof harvesting energy from the sun. Together, we're creating a clean future for all. Hi, how are you? It's great to be here at the uh, National Dealer Convention. Thank you for coming. So I thought I'd tell you a little bit about Fisker Inc. Uh, we just launched our first vehicle um, last year, a fully electric vehicle. Uh, we are an American company based in California on Manhattan Beach. And uh, what I thought would, is really, really interesting is that uh, the entire dealer groups in the U.S. really haven't had a vehicle to sell from an independent American EV company because everybody's going direct to consumer. So I'm extremely excited about being here and talk to dealers. We have already have over 200 uh, dealers interested in our vehicle and I think it's going to offer a new opportunity both for us and for the dealers to sort of get into a unique market segment um, we have created a vehicle that actually have the longest range in the world of any electric SUV in our segment. And that's kind of unique because, you know, there is another company, a big company out there, which is the best-selling EV in the world, uh, which is direct-to-consumer. So I think that gives a whole new perspective for dealers uh, to have a competitor in the showroom that they haven't been able to have before. Uh, I'm especially excited with our new what we call dealer partnership model, which is what we call a triple win. It's a win for the customer with transparent, no hackle pricing, and of course also to get great customer service for the, from the dealers and test drives, etc. nearby. And then of course a win for the dealer because we are offering our dealers a larger territory so they don't have the competitor from Fisker just down the street. And I think that's very important because we want our dealers to have a sustainable, steady margin so they can focus on giving our customers the best possible customer service. And then it's, of course, a win for us because we actually get great customer service close to where the customers are. And the no hackle pricing also means that our customers are happy because that's what they like. And finally, I think that for us, it means we can get out in the market quicker. Right now, we have so many reservation holders all over the U.S. that unfortunately we can't reach. They're hours away. They can't get a test drive. You only have two facilities, one in L.A. and one in New York, which, where they can come and visit us. So obviously, that's going to be hugely different when we suddenly start selling off 50 or 75 dealers across the U.S. So that's something that we are very, very excited about. And finally... Um, I have never, by the way, been at this conference. It's great to meet people that I actually knew from 10 years ago when I worked at Aston Martin and BMW, etc. So I'm kind of excited to get back in and see what's happening in the dealer community and how is our dealer partnership model going to be, you know, looked at. And the first feedback has been really amazing. I think we're doing something really innovative. And of course, we're also coming up with new models that's already in the works. We are coming up with an electric pickup truck that's going to be not a full size, where everybody else is going is going to be a mid-size and starting at a very affordable price, around $45,000. Uh, 
Uh, of course, our ocean starts at $39,000, so I think affordability and profitability in the EV segment is going to be extremely important in the future. I love, like anyone else, a really cool $100,000 electric car, but very few people can afford that. I think the next big movement in EVs is going to be affordability and, of course, profitability. So we have to come up with some exciting vehicles that people want that they can afford. Finally, I will say that Fisker will never launch a vehicle unless we have at least four features that nobody else have or we are, where we are best in class. So just example on the Fisker Ocean, we have the longest range in our class, 360 miles. That's in our class as an electric SUV, 360 mile range. We have the world's largest solar roof, which can get up to 2,000 free miles a year. We are the world's most sustainable car, which we are showing with evidence on our website. We have, for example, over 110 pounds of recycled materials in our vehicle. And then we have something called California mode, which is you push one button and all the glass goes down the car except the front windscreen and the largest sunroof in the world opens up. It's something people actually love about our car. So I think having unique features, getting people to look at something they've never seen before is what really excites me. And I'm looking forward to meet a lot of dealers here this weekend and having a lot of fun. So thank you for coming. Appreciate it. Thank you. And now we'll go ahead and move into our Q&A. Very, very good. I'm Jonathan Collegio with NADA. Super excited to have you here, Henrik. Um, take us behind the curtain in this huge decision that Fisker made to use dealerships. Uh, to use, rather, uh, uh, dealers instead of going the direct-to-consumer model. I mean, there are a number of companies out there that could have ramped up instantly had they just gone to a dealer network model. They, were, they didn't do that. You seem to be going that direction. So take us behind the, the curtain in your decision point. Well, you know, uh, first of all, my background is the car industry. So, you know, I started my career at BMW, and then I worked for Ford Motor Company, Aston Martin, etc. And uh, when we started Fisker Inc. in 2016, I think everybody kind of look to Tesla and say, hey, if Tesla did it, it must be right. Uh, and I think all the startups just automatically went to a direct-to-consumer model. However, as we start looking at it, it was a different time 10 years ago. You know, there was zero interest rate. Uh, there was no competitors. Uh, there was maybe five years to get things done. Now we're in a time with high interest rates. You have three months or six months to get something done. There's less capital available. There's more competitors. So finally, I looked and, and talked with our finance department and saw that actually, even if we sell direct, it's not free for us. We also have to build up a dealership. We have to go out and rent the building. We have to hire people. We have to get you know, lifts. We have to do service. We have to train the technicians. So in the end of the day, we saw that it's actually not cheaper for us to do it. And why not go to the professionals that's built up these amazing dealerships know their you know, local environment, uh, they, they lo know the community, they ha already have a ton of, of uh, you know, people that they've served for many years that are happy with them, they know how to do uh, customer service. So we realized, you know what, maybe we should pivot around and actually work with dealers. And I went to a friend of mine called Bo Buckman that owns a, a group called Galpin Automotive in Los Angeles. And he said, what if we do something from scratch? from a white sheet of paper, yep. and we call it the dealer partnership model, because it's a partnership. So that's kind of how we start working on this no-hackle pricing, and he told me, you know, it's not just the customers that don't like hackling, we don't like it neither, and I go, really? He says, no, we don't like it neither. I said, okay, let's do it then. So we kind of went through every part, and we decided that there is a way to make this a fantastic agreement and a great partnership. So that's kind of how it came around. Yeah, I mean, a, a franchise contract can dictate all of those things. It doesn't have to just, you know, it doesn't have to be the contracts that were, you know, written up in the 1950s. It can specify every single one of those things. And to your point, uh, local dealerships across the country, I believe, are sitting on somewhere in the neighborhood of 180 to $200 billion in hard assets, buildings, land. Uh, you can't build that in a, in a, in a high interest rate environment. So uh, it's neat that you said that. Now, your background, of course, Highline Luxury, some of the most beautiful designs in the world. This company is more focused on the middle of the market. Um, you talk about profitability. 
kind of take us into where you see the market going and how it's going to be profitable for Fisker to be able to sell these kind of mid-range vehicles? Well, first of all, I think generally in the market, um, in the last few years, there was probably an opinion that as, as long as a traditional car maker made an EV, it would sell. Yep. Because EV was hot. And I think was what, what, what was forgotten a little bit was that I think people still want an exciting vehicle even if they buy an EV. And maybe particular if they buy an EV, they're expecting more. They're expecting, wow, it's an EV. What else is new? So what we looked at at Fisker was we, can't, we just don't want to make another EV. We have to make something that's differentiated, something that offers people something they can't get anywhere else. That's why I talked about the four features we're doing. Secondly, we also thought about affordability. So when we designed our vehicle, we actually designed it at a, as a very high volume vehicle. We looked at cost everywhere and really looked at where do we give the consumer something and maybe we need to forget about what we think we know about customers and cars because the way cars are done today is the same way they were done 50 years ago. We really haven't changed the mindset. And I think we drive very different now. We think very different about our cars today than we did 50 years or 40 years or 30 years ago. So we looked into all that and, and really got the pricing down. If you, you look at our price, $39,000 starting price, it's actually better than a lot of other competitors. And because we looked at all these areas, and finally, if you have a giant car company with 100,000 employees, where maybe 20,000 employees don't really help building the car, you have to pay for all these people. So the normal giant car companies in the meantime are so big that they have to take thousands of dollars and put on top of each car before they sell it to the dealer. And that means that they will not have the profitability that we have because we're extremely lean. We are trying to avoid to have all this overhead. We have contract manufacturing. We have set ourselves up sort of with the Apple model. As you know, many of you probably have an iPhone. Well, they designed this iPhone. They sell it. They market it. They own the IP, but they don't build it. Magna is doing your manufacturing. Magna is building our vehicles, and they built Japanese cars, they built German cars, so they have to be very competitive. So we are paying a very competitive price for assembly, and that's how we make money, because we have low price for assembly, we have low overhead cost, and we have a very low build of materials for our vehicle. Now, you made news last week. Uh, you signed Damien Mills, the Mills Auto Group, based out of North Carolina, as your first dealership group. I know that you're here. You're looking for dealers to sell your vehicles. How's that going? It's going amazing. Uh, I think we have over 200 interested dealers. We are me meeting with many of them here. And, uh, you know, I, what we want to look for is who gives the best customer service, who is in the areas uh, we want to be in. What we really want is the dealers to help build our brand, to, to do it together. And I think that's a unique opportunity. Today, if you get a dealership from maybe a brand, there's already, you know, hundreds of dealers. But in our case, we might pick a dealer with a giant territory, whereas as we expand, that dealer can decide to open new stores in his territory or not, but he will have first right of refusal. So we offer the dealer a unique opportunity to grow with us as we introduce new cars, you know, a pickup truck, a lower car SUV, a sports car, et cetera. And that, I think that's very unique, and I think it's very exciting. We have seen a lot of excitement for people, uh, for dealers, because it's sort of very entrepreneurial, Something they probably have done many years ago, but maybe haven't done so often lately. So we had uh, the U.S. Energy Secretary Jennifer Granholm on this on this stage uh, earlier this morning. We talked a little bit about um, the difficulties that some of the traditional manufacturers are seeing in attracting customers into EVs. Many of them, General Motors made a made a big announcement earlier this week about how they're going to reinvest in plug-in hybrids. Is Fisker specifically focused on EVs, or plug-ins, or different powertrains part of your future? I mean, we are focused on EVs, and quite frankly, if other companies go out of EVs, I just see the markets being bigger for us. I want to come back to the point that we have no reason of being here if we just made another, another normal car that was an EV. So we really focus on being differentiated. We focus on competing with other independent EV makers. I don't think we focus so much on the traditional car companies because I think that the people who come to us they have already decided they want to buy an, an EV from an independent car maker. They want to have unique features. So, I, yes, we have, we have uh, uh, obviously customers coming from some of the traditional luxury car makers from Germany, et cetera. But we all, most of our, co uh, um, you know, 
our trade-ins, if you want, are coming from current independent EV makers, and you can imagine who that would be. In terms of your deployment, United States, Europe, China, are you looking into the Chinese market as well? Eventually China. We are focused on US and Europe right now. They've done it extremely well for us. We see orders coming every single day. We have actually not seen a slowdown in terms of orders coming in from us. Uh, we are seeing still a lot of excitement around our car. And we have so much to do that US and, and Europe is enough for us at the moment. We, have, uh, uh, we are opening a, sh uh, a showroom in Shanghai this year, but we won't start selling cars until next year because we have enough traction here in the US and, US at the, uh, US and Europe at the moment. So getting, getting back to uh, spectacular designs, Highline Luxury, tell us about the Ronin. It's an amazing vehicle. Did you design that yourself? I did. Uh, you know, that's a passion project. You know, over 1,000 horsepower. It's going to have over 600 mile range. It's going to have, it's going to be the world's first four-door convertible with butterfly doors and, a, uh, you know, automatic removable hard chop into the trunk. It's, it's going to be a five-seater, so you can actually bring the kids to school in your 1,000 horsepower sports car. Uh, exactly what I want to do. Uh, so is this one of those cars you just dream about? It's going to be a dream car. I think, you know... We all love cars, and we've got to have that emotion. Even if we make an electric car, it's got to be emotional. And one of the things I think about every single day when I wake up is, how are we going to translate that emotion that we have from gasoline cars, where you have sound, where you have downshift and all that, how are you going to shift that over to electric cars? Because, you know, the thing that we grew up with was we, we learned how to tame an animal, which was the car. But now an electric car, anybody, your grandmother can go in and one go zero to 60 in four seconds. There's no skill to that. So we're trying to figure out what is now the excitement? What is the sense of occasion when you get into this car? And I think that will shift. We're also having new people, you know, tech entrepreneurs that are 25, 30 years old buying their first cars. And it's not necessarily a gasoline car. So they have just bypassed the gasoline car experience. So we need to think about that as we bring out new cars. Electric cars are 100% here to stay, and they are going to take over. We are going to see more than 80% of cars being electric, sometimes beginning at 2030s, whether we like it or not, because eventually nobody's going to buy a gasoline car because nobody's going to buy it used when you want to sell it five years later. Very good. Well, we're about out of time. Thank you so much for your time. Everyone, Henrik Plissinger. Thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you.